Can this pass if it couldn't pass with the border attached? I, I think it's going to be very difficult. The reason the peace with the border in it didn't pass was because there are significant problems and challenges with the border bill as it was drafted. Uh, if you look at it from a 50,000 foot level, what the bill does, on the border at least, is offer over 20 billion more dollars, new dollars, and new authorities to an administration that hasn't enforced the law. What it does is it actually codifies some of the things that have been going on here in terms of catch and release. It uses Orwellian terms like non-custodial detention. Uh, I'm sure when you were a kid, you wouldn't want to go to detention yeah. hall with no, cust no custodian. I mean, things like this need to be fixed and addressed. That's what you saw in the earlier but vote. But, Senator, that's it's all you're, you're referring to. Yeah, you're referring to the bill that effectively is now dead unless it's somehow resurrected. My question is about what you could have a chance to vote on now going forward. Would you, and do you think enough of your colleagues on the Republican side, would be supportive of passing something that did not include those border measures but did provide funding to our allies? Certainly I won't be there. Uh, we've got to deal with our own national security before we deal with the national security of other nations. We've got to fix this and we've got to address it. This isn't the time, in my view, to bring the Ukraine bill, Taiwan, everything else to the floor. What we need to be doing is addressing our own security first. We didn't get there today. Uh, and we're not going to get there by voting on something without any border security either. And I think it will have very grim prospects in the House of Representatives. Well, what we're hearing, Senator, is you're never going to vote on any kind of a border bill or certainly pass one as long as Donald Trump is running for president, that he wants this to be a campaign issue uh, that a number of Republican lawmakers do as well. Uh, is, is this a matter that our listeners and viewers will have to wait for the election to see resolved? That, that is, uh, I know that's a talking point that's coming from the Democrat side, certainly coming out of the White House, uh, but that is not correct at all. The, the, you know, what, what amazes me is that in 2021, this White House, this administration, there's no problem at our southern border. There's no crisis there. 2022, the border is secure. 2023, there's no problem, no crisis, asked Secretary Mayorkas. Now suddenly there's a crisis, and they're pointing to Republicans as the one being in charge of this, being responsible for it. That is not correct. What's been put forward in terms of this bill doesn't get us there, doesn't get us where we need to get. And I am more than willing to work on something that will get us there. But this bill did not cut the, did not cut the mustard, and it will not work. I know that you think we should be focused on our borders domestically, but of course, Americans don't just exist in the confines of, of the country. There are Americans that are now troops finding themselves in danger in the Middle East as we continue to see the conducting of attacks from Iranian proxies. We did get news within the last hour or so that there has been a strike conducted by the U.S. in Iraq that has killed a commander of the Iran-backed militia that the U.S. says is uh, responsible for planning some of these attacks. What is the farthest step that the Biden administration should take here? Should we be attacking Iran directly, striking them at home, or would that escalate things in the region and put troops in even greater danger? Again, let's take a step back. What we've done is we've been extraordinarily inconsistent in dealing with Iran and its proxies. You've got a military presence there. You just, you just cited the most recent military action. That should be a deterrent, but it will not work if our diplomatic posture and our economic posture are not consistent. In fact, what we're doing is we have failed to enforce the sanctions on Iran that would have stopped the flow of, of funds to, the, to that nation. What they've been able to do since Joe Biden came into office is they've unleashed the flow of illicit oil sales. I worked in the previous administration. I was U.S. ambassador to Japan. One of my jobs was to get the Japanese to stop buying Iranian crude oil. We did that. We put maximum pressure on Iran. What happened? Their reserves came down to below $8 billion. Now they're well over $100 billion because the money began to flow immediately when the Bidens came into office. So what would you do now, Senator? What would Bill Haggerty do? I would impose, I would put the harshest economic sanctions in place right now. I would make it very clear that Iranian oil sales are no more. I would use every sanction in the book and make our economic sanctions line up with our military posture. I would make our diplomatic speak very clear as well that we will not tolerate this. And as you see military action, we should not be taking anything off the table. Uh, instead, this administration telegraphs, you know, hours and days ahead that they're going to strike back. They're going to say that we don't want to escalate anything with Iran. Well, guess what? You take escalation off the table, you take a big tool of deterrence off the table. We need to come back to a strong diplomatic, economic, and military position to deal with Iran. It needs to be consistent. Do you believe, sir, then, that economic sanctions on Iran will actually cause Iranian proxies who say they do not actually take direct directives from 
Tehran itself to cease all of their behavior? How strong do you think the link really is that just going after Iran economically would, would translate to changes in military-esque behavior? Well, under President Trump, it certainly did work because by 2019, 2020, it was widely reported that Hamas and Hezbollah were broke. What that message would send to Iran, you, you know that this is Iranian funding going there. You know this is Iranian technology and Iranian know-how behind the Houthis, behind Hezbollah, behind Hamas. It would send a very strong message. And Iran, I know they say that they don't control these proxies, but I think you know the truth of the matter. They absolutely do. And, Senator, finally, obviously, we've been asking you these questions as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. You are also a member of the Senate Banking Committee, and tomorrow you yes. will have the chance to question Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. She was before the House Financial Services Committee yesterday and was asked about what we're seeing with NYCB and commercial real estate challenges that these, some of these banks are facing. NYCB, of course, the poster child right now. To what degree are you concerned about that, and do you think the Treasury Secretary's answers on this issue specifically yesterday were adequate. I think there's a lot to be concerned about here. You're talking about the bank that acquired Signature Bank's assets. That, yeah. that bank is highly concentrated in New York. The commercial real estate portfolio there has a lot of office space that is not being fully utilized right now. Uh, I think you've got to look at this on a state-by-state, region-by-region basis to understand what the risk looks like. But I'd very much like to know how she's thinking about it, how regulators are thinking about it, because it is a matter of concern. Also, the debt issuance that's uh, underway. We, we're issuing a record amount of debt right now. I'd like to start record amounts of debt right now. I'd like to know how she's thinking about managing Treasury auctions going forward as well. It should be an interesting day tomorrow with the Secretary. Yeah. Senator, when should the Fed start cutting? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question of the hour. Uh, I think when they should start cutting is when the numbers and t tell them to do so. The Fed has said it's data-driven. It needs to stick to that and not respond to political pressure. And I think you know this. The Fed is getting a tremendous amount of political pressure right now from the other side of the aisle. Uh, letters come from Sherrod Brown, from, from Elizabeth Warren trying to press them to go ahead and start cutting rates right now. They want to see the economy shift into high gear coming into the election. The Fed should not succumb to political pressure. The Fed should remain data-driven and maintain its reputation in the process.